Hello, I believe we are recording, so let's get ready for our lecture. Okay, uh, here we go. Today's lecture is on all the different interactions the X-ray photon can have with uh, matter, typically the patient's body or any matter. Okay, so let's start with um, the five interactions that we'll discuss. And they're in order of energy. So the lowest energy would be coherent scattering. The next one is Compton, then photoelectric effect. And then these crazy high energy things like pair production and photo disintegration, which are beyond the energy range of diagnostic imaging. It's Compton and photoelectric that we're going to spend the most of our time on um, because they end up setting uh, the contrast that we get on our image. So uh, we'll start with a brief review. Remember electromagnetic radiation is mainly going to interact with structures that are similar in size to the wavelength of the radiation. And as the uh, energy goes up, we're going to see that the wavelength goes down. As energy goes up, frequency goes up. As energy goes up, wavelength goes down. And we've got Planck's equation here. And if you need more on that, there is an X-ray Bob video on Planck's equation, Planck's constant. But higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength. And so you'll see that the low energy X-rays are going to interact with the whole atom. The moderate energy X-rays are going to interact with the electrons. And the high energy stuff will interact directly with the nuclear force or the nucleus itself. We'll start with coherent scattering, which also goes by the name of classical scattering or unmodified scattering or Thompson or Rayleigh scattering. Uh, unmodified because the wavelength won't get modified. And this is low energy stuff. So x-rays down at 10 to 30 keV, stuff we're trying to filter out anyway. Basically, one is the incident x-ray photon interacts with the atom and the atom becomes excited. Here's our incident x-ray, here's our atom, and you see that it leaves and that they say lambda prime, the wavelength out, and lambda are equal. So it's going to leave with the same energy. The second thing that happens is, well, that atom was excited, so that atom is going to release that excess energy as a scattered x-ray wavelength equal in energy to that incident. So first, the x-ray uh, interacts with the atom, it gets excited. Second, the atom relaxes and releases that uh, x-ray photon of equal energy. But it's slightly deflected. Um, that scattered x-ray exits at a small deflection angle. It's still roughly going forward, but it's got a small angle of deflection. Straightforward view, straight on, it's deflected a little bit. So what we've got is the change in the direction without a change in energy. So it's mainly scattered in a forward direction because it was going forward and that angle is small. There's no energy transfer, the atom is not ionized, the, and it's pretty unimportant to radiology, radiography. It makes up only about 3% of the scatter of our image. And all it does is contribute to some noise or a fogging of our receptor. So here's our primary beam. 99% never reach our IR. We'll talk about Compton and photoelectric later. But basically, this, this ray D is kind of scattered forward. And it could have been a Compton scatter or this coherent scatter. 100% of our scatter is shown here. Roughly 97% of it is Compton scatter, and only 3% is coherent. And all it does is add some fog to our image receptor and chew into our contrast budget. The primary event is that X-ray photon excites an orbital electron, but it doesn't have enough energy to eject it. That incident X-ray photon is absorbed, the atom is excited. The second state is that excited atom emits a scattered photon, um, of equal energy to relax back to its state. The products are the scattered photon equal in energy to the incident photon, but now it's made a slight deflection in its path. The next one is Compton. Oh, not that Compton. It's the Compton effect. And this Compton effect, is, or Compton scattering, this is what just makes our radiograph gets gray. It just reduces the contrast and it adds fog to our image. And also, the scatter due to Compton is the source of um, occupational dose, of the dose we get for
for being in a room. Like if we're doing fluoroscopy, uh, we've got this Compton effect scattering off of the patient going to us. It goes by several names as well. It goes by Compton scatter or Compton effect or incoherent scatter or modified scatter because it modifies the wavelength of the X-ray photon. So these are a little higher energy. They're above 30 keV. And we'll see here, we've got our incident X-ray. It comes in, it ejects an outer shell electron or an orbital electron, and it's typically got a larger deflection angle than the coherent. And here they show us our angle, they show us our wavelength in and our wavelength out, and our wavelength out is larger than our wavelength in because we lose some energy. And the electron that we kick out, we call it a Compton electron, or we'll call it a recoil electron, both are fair game. So that ejected electron is a recoil or a Compton electron. And the atom is ionized. We've ripped off an electron. So it's now an ion. The atom's got a positive charge. So we got a math formula that the energy of the incident photon equals the energy of the scattered photon plus the binding energy of whatever outer shell electron we ejected from or orbit plus the kinetic energy that it travels away at, that uh, ejected electron. So the scattered electron actually has most of the energy. And all of it, that's those scattered electrons just set up as noise on our radiograph because uh, they're randomly scattered. They're not um, straight up from where the bone was or the soft tissue was. Another thing to know is that multiple Compton scatters can occur, and then we might end up with a photoelectric effect at the end. But a single X-ray photon can cause several scatters, can get scattered several times, and can eject several electrons. And the probability that this will occur will be inversely proportional to the energy of the X-ray. So higher energy X-rays will have less probability of causing a scatter. It'll be directly proportional to how dense the material is we're traveling through and how thick the material it is, but it doesn't care about the uh, atomic number of the material. It's independent of that. So here we see bone and soft tissue. They have separate curves because they have different densities, uh, but they're not separate because of atomic number. And here we've got the probability of a, a Compton effect occurring, and you see both decrease as the energy level goes up. Those scattered x-rays are junk. They don't provide any useful information on the image, and all the scatter just provides a uniform fogging of our image, which reduces our Compton, our Compton, our, the quality of our contrast. The Compton effect is about 97% of our scatter, and we said coherent was about the other three. Our summary is that the incident photon ejects an orbital electron, typically outer shell, and is deflected, typically with a good size deflection angle. The products are the scattered photon of less energy, the ejected electron, and an ionized atom. And the probability of it occurring depends on its energy and doesn't care about the material's atomic number. So we can do some math. We got a formula. So within a body, we got a 40 kV x-ray. It goes through a Compton interaction with an L-shell electron of calcium. The absolute value of the binding energy for L-shells of calcium is a half a kV. And the recoil electron speeds away with 5 kV. So what's left, the missing term, what's the energy of the Compton scattered photon? So here we've got our formula, and we'll plug in our values. 40 went in. We don't know what the scatter was, but we do know we burnt a half a kV to eject that electron, and that electron went traveling off at 5 kV. So we can solve that and end up with 34.5 kV is the, the energy of our scattered electron, scattered photon. God forbid we mix up photon and electron. Okay, our next effect is the photoelectric effect. This is what makes our radiographic imaging possible, and it's gives us the contrast we want, the subject contrast. It's, you know, it, takes, it occurs from energies from 10 to like 150 keV. And what happens is, one, the incident X-ray photon ejects an inner shell, inner shell, inner shell. Did I say inner shell? Inner shell electron. The photon is completely absorbed, and the atom is now ionized. We ejected what is called 
a photoelectron, an electron that was created by a X-ray photon. It's like any other electron, but let's give it a confusing name. All right, two, what happens is we've got this vacancy, so our electrons drop into an inner shell and fill that vacancy, and yes, when that happens, you, we form a characteristic X-ray. But this stuff is our body, calcium, and um, low atomic number material. So the X-ray photon that's formed by that vacancy getting filled is insignificant, it's low energy, it's not going to do nothing. So remember that formula for the Compton equation? Well, the photoelectric's just like it, except it doesn't have a scattered photon. So let's cross that out, and boom, there's our formula for the photoelectric effect. The energy of the incident photon is equal to the binding energy of that inner shell electron that we're going to inject, and the kinetic energy of which that photon photoelectron goes traveling off at. There is no scattered photon. And we can't do anything if that EP is not greater than the binding energy. If our incident energy isn't strong enough to eject that inner shell electron, we're not going to have a photoelectric event occur. <coughs> okay, so the other thing is that we're going to see uh, most photoelectrics are produced just when the energy is just above that binding energy. Because you'll see that the probability of the photoelectric effect occurring will rapidly drop as the energy increases. So for a while you've got no photoelectric because you're less than the binding energy. Then you've got your highest probability of a photoelectric effect after you've passed that binding energy. And then it's going to drop back off as energy increases. So we could do math. <clears throat> A 30 kV undergoes a photoelectric interaction with a K shell of calcium in our body. What's going to be the kinetic energy of the photoelectron that speeds away? We'll go to our little chart. See carbon, oxygen, calcium. Those are in our body. They have loose binding energies because they're not massive nucleuses. This problem wants us to use calcium's K shell. So we'll say EP, the 30 kV that went in, equals that 4 kV of binding energy. Yeah, I got rid of the negative sign. It wasn't helping me. Plus what the kinetic energy that it travels away at. So I solve for that kinetic energy. 30 minus 4 is 26. So that photoelectron is speeding away with 26 kV. So now the probability of photoelectric is a little funnier. It decreases inversely proportional to energy cubed. Compton was just 1 over energy photoelectric is 1 over energy cubed. And photoelectric cares about the atomic number of the material. And that's great. So we'll see bone differently than soft tissue because they're made of different uh, materials. And so we're going to see that we're, the photoelectric effect, probability of a photoelectric effect occurring, is directly proportional to the atomic number raised to the power of 3. So our summary is the incident electron, the incident photon, ejects an inner shell electron, and the photons completely absorbed. The products are that ejected photoelectron and an ionized atom. And the probability of this thing happening is proportional to atomic number cubed over energy cubed. So here we're going to get some real confusing stuff. So here we've got that Compton decreasing as energy increases, and it's proportional to 1 over energy. But the photoelectric decreases even faster as energy increases because it's proportional to the energy cubed. So get this. If we were to look at photoelectric relative to Compton, you would see that as energy goes up, they both drop off, but since photoelectric drops off even faster, the amount of photoelectric events relative to the Compton events um, starts decreasing. So it looks like photoelectric's going down and Compton's going up. Compton's not going up, but what's happening is photoelectric is going down so quickly that it looks like Compton's going up relative to photoelectric. And Compton is just scatter. And so contrast really is the ratio of how many photoelectric effects are we having relative to Compton. Photoelectric is our desirable effect that's going to give us our different absorption based on the material that we're traveling through while Compton is just a whole bunch of scatter. So we see as we raise our energy, we get less photoelectric or more relative amount of Compton, 
and we start losing contrast. All right, so that's a tricky concept. We'll go over it in class to reinforce it. Both go down, photoelectric and Compton, but the relative amount of photoelectric to Compton is what changes. And it makes it look like Compton goes up. There's more Compton present at the higher energy relative to the amount of photoelectric present at the higher energy because the photoelectric dropped off much more rapidly as the energy increased. All right, we got three more, but they're simple. Oh, two more. Better yet, a pair to go. All right, so pair production is our next one. For this, we have to have energies over 1.02 mega electron volts. And really, that's the energy equivalent of two electrons. Uh, remember, e equals mc squared. So if we took two electrons and took their masses and figured out that energy, that would be 1.02 MeV. And unless our x-rays are greater than that, we can't have a pair production event occur. So this pair production stuff doesn't happen in diagnostic. We never set our KVP to 1.02 mega electron volts. It is a very popular event for positron emission tomography, um, which is done in nuclear medicine. They're looking at uh, this kind of interaction. So again, our first thing is the incident photon. It's high enough energy to get past all that electron electric field, and it interacts directly with the nuclear forces, the nuclear field, and it's transformed into a positron and electron. So that photon is gone, and it's transformed into two things. One is an electron, and one is a positron. Positron is antimatter. So the electron, its story is the electron goes on its little Murray way, here it is, until it finds some vacancy in some orbital shell and some nearby atom, and then it comes to rest and fits right in with the new shell. It's the positron that's trouble. It's going to travel until it finds an electron, and then it's going to collide with that electron in any matter and matter. They're going to go boom, and it's going to have an annihilation event. And what's going to happen is we're going to convert the mass of the positron and the electron into two new X-ray photons. Those X-ray photons are equal in energy. We're back to the 0.51 MeVs, and that's called annihilation radiation or annihilation event. And that's what's happening. Those gamma detectors in nuke matter are detecting uh, that annihilation radiation. Particle ISIS. I didn't have ISIS has anything to do with this talk. All right, so the summary is that photon interacts directly with the nucleus. It's uh, transformed into a positron and an electron. Those positron and electrons leave the atom. The electron finds a home, but the positron is going to go cause some trouble. It finds an electron, and they annihilate each other, and they release two photons. So the product is two X-ray photons. Our last one is photo disintegration. And it's last because your, your, your uh, attention span is disintegrating as well. For this, we have to have crazy high X-ray energies greater than 10 MeV. So again, it's not happening in diagnostic radiography. Here, the X-ray comes in, and it is completely absorbed by the nucleus, but now the nucleus is unstable. It's at this excited, unstable state. So what the nucleus does is it tears off a piece, a fragment, a proton, a neutron, an alpha particle, whatever it does, it tears some of itself off and ejects that nuclear fragment so it can return to a happy, relaxed, ground, stable state. So simple, that primary event is the nucleus absorbs that X-ray photon, the atom is now crazy unstable, secondary is the nucleus rips off some kind of fragment to regain stability. And what do we got as a product? We've got that ejected nuclear particle, whatever that fragment was, and that atom is now a new atom because it's got a new Z number. It probably ripped off at least one proton or one neutron, um, and its Z number probably changed and it's, we'll have to call it something else. It's got a new name. All right, again, like always, I can't take any credit. I want to thank uh, the authors uh, who I rip off both problems and graphs from. So uh, my primary influences are Quinn Carroll and uh, Dr. Bouchong and Dr. Carroll. So a shout out to both of them. And uh, this is X-Ray Bob, out. Click, click, escape.